<clears throat> What's going on? How y'all feeling, man? This is uh, my name is Jordan Larson, and um, you know, I've been having a lot of people asking me lately. <clears throat> Curious, you know, a lot of people have seen the growth and seen the progress and seen the transformation that I've made through Jesus Christ and being a follower of Jesus Christ, and um, so a lot of people have been asking me about my testimony and be want, been wanting me to share, you know. So and I, I feel like God's been putting it in my heart, and I think it's about time that um, it's about time that I share my testimony. So um. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know, it's crazy, it's, it's a lot to it. And it's kind of, it's like so all over the place, so sometimes I don't even know where to start or... Um, but yeah, you know, I grew up just basically me and my mom, you know, like when I was about five, six years old, my dad had gotten into some trouble and caught a case. So he ended up, you know, instead of dealing with it and dealing with doing the time or whatever it is that he had to do, <clears throat> he ended up moving to California and kind of ended up just, just running from it, so... For most of my life, you know, I didn't really have that male role model, model or that father figure in my life. So it was just me and my mom. You know, I got introduced to the streets when I was about <clears throat> when I was about 14, 15 years old. You know, I got introduced to drugs. I got introduced. You know, I started smoking weed. I got introduced to the streets, and it's just kind of one of those things where when I got introduced to that, it just kind of stuck with me. You know, and, you know, my mom. She was a good mom. She worked hard. <clears throat> She did everything she could for me. She was a great mom. She always made sure there was food on the table. She always, she always worked hard to give me everything that I needed. And um, so so none of this, nothing that I went through was 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 really her fault. <clears throat> it's just one of those things, you know. Um, she tried to keep me away from the streets and tried to keep me, you know, me uh, try to keep me away from situations and stuff like that. But you know, I was young. I was I was naive. I was I was deceived. And as a young dude, you know, when you get introduced to the streets and you don't really have that male, that fatherly discipline, you know, I was going to do what I wanted to do as, as a young teenager. <clears throat> and um, I was going to have to deal with the consequences and repercussions that came along with that. Amen. So, but yeah, I got introduced to the streets about 14, 15 years old. It started out with doing drugs, <clears throat> started out with like just smoking weed and drinking and stuff like that. And, um... You know, it's just one of those things where when you get introduced to the streets, like, you know it's wrong, but when you don't have that that sense of family growing up, you know, I always, I always, I've always been the outcast. I've always been the black sheep of my family. You know, I never fit in. Not even just, you know, in the world. I never fit in in the world. I never fit in in my family. They were all like, you know, they didn't really understand who I was. They didn't really understand me or what I've been through. They didn't understand the kind of person I was. It didn't make sense to them why I did the things I did and why I went through the stuff I went through. So instead of like coming to me and being the kind of people like, <clears throat> yo, are you okay? What like what's going on? Instead of talking to me and kind of trying to be there for me and find a solution, they kind of just turned their back on me. So not having that sense of family and always being alone, you know, in the streets are welcoming you with open arms. It's like, okay, why not? You know, even though deep down, like you kind of know it's wrong, but you know, when the streets are welcoming you and you know you got these people and you know that, that are gonna act as if they're your family. You kind of just, you go along with it. You know, I was never really, I was never a follower either. I, I always had, I've always been a leader. I've always been kind of like, you know, I've always had this special thing about me. I've always had leadership skills and people have saw that in me. But when I got introduced to the streets, it just kind of stuck with me. You know, like I was young, I was dumb, I was naive, I was deceived. So <clears throat> I kind of just went with it because that's just, you know, it started to kind of be like what I knew. So, um. You know, it's funny, you know, like my mom, she had got tired of me. I was running the streets. I was, I was, I was stealing. I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing. Um, I wasn't doing good in school. I was getting in trouble in school and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of crazy, you know, when I was about 15 years old, <clears throat> I kind of rekindled, me and my dad rekindled our, our relationship. He He came for a Christmas one time. And my mom pretty much told him, like, I've had enough of him. I can't handle him. I don't know what to do with him. So I kind of, um, <clears throat> we decided it might be best for me to go out and live with my dad in California. So, um, we thought this would be a good thing, you know, but little did we know all the stuff, all the gang banging, the drugs, the dope dealing, all the violence, all the things that was going on at Rockford <clears throat> was going to be 10 times that in California. So, and I didn't, you know, I was still young, you know, I was only 15 years old. I didn't still, I didn't have the same mindset that I do now. So it don't really matter where you go in life just because I moved somewhere. I still move with the same mindset. So therefore nothing was going to change. So I moved to California. We moved to um, Long Beach, California. 
<clears throat> east side long beach california i started going to school out there you know i was lonely out there i didn't really know nobody me and my dad you know it would have been so long so we was kind of like best friends so <clears throat> when he would discipline me it was kind of like I would listen sometimes, but then I wouldn't because he had been gone for so long. So it's almost like I still had resentment toward him, even though like I forgave him. But um, I got introduced to some people out there, you know, the friends I decided to, again, when the streets are welcoming you with open arms and you ain't got no family, you ain't really got nobody. You kind of just, okay, was to it, you know? So my dad knew I started to get involved with some dangerous people out there. You know, I started smoking weed. I started getting violent. You know, you know, in California, there's neighborhoods where you go to and it's just all they do is gang bang. All they do is do drugs, sell drugs, rob people. So it's like when I got introduced to that, you learn to man up real quick. You know, and um, I would be in certain neighborhoods. Somebody walk up on you, be like, you know, ask you, where you from? What you doing over here? <clears throat> and you got to fight. And it's like you, you learn to man up real quick because... <clears throat> It shocks you, but it's like, dang, like I don't even, I don't even know you. But they come up on you, and you ain't got no choice but to fight. So if they swing on you, or you got to swing on them, either way, you learn to man up because you got to fight. You ain't got no choice. It's either you fight or you get beat up on, and that's what that's just that's just how I was out there, and that's what you had to do. So it was violent. And um, I also got introduced to harder drugs. That's when I started, you know, doing cocaine. You know, everybody else around was doing it, so it's just like. You know, you start smoking weed, you start drinking, and then that leads to another thing. And then, okay, I'm going to just try this one time, and it ain't going to be nothing. So, yeah, me trying something and thinking that was going to be that, I ended up getting addicted to it. So that's when I started battling the spirit of addiction ten times more than what I was before. I was already addicted to smoking weed and, and all that kind of stuff. But I got introduced to cocaine. I got addicted to that. You know, my dad started seeing how I was living. He started seeing me you know, stealing and, and, you know, started seeing me, you know, getting into fights, you know, and I was like, I'm white and Asian. So like to them, you know, I was the white boy in a neighborhood that, you know, <laughs> obviously wasn't that. So I got picked on a lot. I got jumped on a lot. And um, I got myself in a lot of situations where I could have gotten killed. You know, something could have happened to me. I could have died. My dad and my mom could have got that phone call. You know what I'm saying? But um, that's just kind of the lifestyle that I got wrapped up in. And uh, my dad, you know, he had got tired of it too, you know, and um, so he ended up, you know, it's crazy in the midst of all this, I ended up moving back to Rockford when I was like 16 because I missed my family out there, you know, my, my friends, my homies out there. <clears throat> and so I ended up actually being doing something stupid with one of my homies. I had caught it in a, an attempted robbery charge. We tried, we tried to rob somebody being stupid, just not having no money, just being around the wrong things. You know, we didn't have no Jesus in our life, obviously. And when you grow up like that, when you're around that kind of environment, you don't realize the decisions you're making now are going to affect you later on. So I had ended up doing 30 days in juvenile detention center for that. Got out on probation, decided, okay, let me move back to California. <clears throat> so I ended up moving back to California and um, getting on probation out there. But see, out there, they didn't drug test. They didn't do any of that. If, if, you don't, if your case doesn't have to do with drugs or nothing like that, <clears throat> they're not going to drug test you. So I was still doing what I was doing. I was still in the streets. I got right back around them same people. And um, my dad had got tired of it. So when I was about 17, you know, me and my dad was getting into it. We was constantly fighting, arguing back and forth. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to handle it. So at 17 years old, he actually, he kicked me out on, its, on the streets. And I was literally homeless at 17 years old. Now, did he have to kick me? Did I feel like he had to kick me out? Of course, at the time, no, I don't feel like he did. I don't know if I would have done that to my child, but I understand why he did it. But I was a kid, you know, like I was I was introduced to this to this kind of lifestyle. <clears throat> and that's how the devil gets our young, our youth and our children. You know, he makes us think that this lifestyle is cool. And um, he introduces us to the streets and it's all demonic. It's all the Satan. It's all the devil. That lifestyle is not cool. The streets is not cool. Doing drugs is not cool. The devil is a liar. This is what the devil uses to um, suck in our youth and put us in chains and in bondage and have us controlled by these evil spirits. The spirits of addiction, the spirits of violence, the spirits of anger, the spirits of poverty, whatever it is. This is how the devil sucks us in and keeps us trapped. Right, because we're young, we're naive, and we're deceived, so we don't know any better, and we're seduced, and it's like we're under a spell. 
And this is how the devil gets us. This is how the devil got me. So I'm on the streets homeless at 17 years old. Literally, I remember it got so bad. I was on the streets doing drugs, sleeping on park benches at 17 years old. I would literally, I had no money. <clears throat> my mom wouldn't give me money. My dad wouldn't give me money. I was literally stealing from people just to eat my next meal. I remember just being up in the streets all night. I would sleep on park benches. I would sleep at parks. I would sleep. I would sleep at parks. At, um, I would sleep on benches at the beach. Cause literally, I was homeless at 17. 17-year-old 17 kid, not knowing nothing, not knowing what to do. And um, I would I would be stealing from grocery stores. I would literally steal from people just to eat my next meal. That's how bad it got. And to think back now and how far I came, and how far God brought me, I'm forever grateful. You know, but this is this is only the beginning. <clears throat> of my testimony so eventually you know I had I actually had a daughter out there I had my first baby out there <clears throat> and um I was only 17 she was like 21 so that's messed up already right there but uh, um long story short my mom decided that she was gonna save me once again and she was gonna take me back so I ended up moving back to Rockford and me and my dad kind of made a promise to each other right like you get right you get clean and you can come back out here that never really happened like that um, because I still didn't have the same mindset. I was still trapped and still being controlled by the spirit of addiction, the spirit of depression, the spirit of anger, the spirit of violence, whatever it was. And um, so I moved back out to Rockford. I ended up having another daughter. And um, this is where I would I was actually moved back to Rockford when I was almost like 18, almost 19. And um, <clears throat> I was I would actually meet the woman who. I was gonna marry who I had my son with. Yes, I got three baby mamas and I live to tell the story. Um, but yeah, when I moved back to Rockford, it was the same thing. My mom gave me a chance. I was I was dealing with different jobs, getting fired from jobs, still drinking, still partying. I was getting in, in so many fights. I was getting in altercations. I was I was doing drugs. That's all I was doing. That's all I knew. I was drinking, partying, messing with different women. Um, getting into fights, getting into violent altercations with people. You know, but I would eventually meet the woman, like I said, that was gonna be my wife. We got married, and that was a toxic situation. Very toxic. Um, but you know, like we loved each other, right? So <clears throat> I don't know if it was just like our sexual attraction or because it was we were in love with the idea of what we wanted it to be or what we thought it would be. <clears throat> but we were just, you know, we were young and in love and um but it was toxic. We didn't know what we were doing. You know, we were too young to really know how to maturely, like an adult, um, handle a relationship and handle a marriage. So we ended up a few years, years later getting married, you know, like some years go by. Nothing changed. We were toxic. We ended up being like mentally, verbally abusive to each other. You know, the resentment started to cause anger and started to cause us to constantly be angry, constantly going back and forth. You know, I was being manipulated. I was being lied to all the time. And um, it made me resent. Eventually, we, you know, there was infidelities. Both of us committed adultery. And, you know, when you do that, when you give yourself to somebody else and you step outside of your marriage, God is going to strike you down. God is going to slap you down and he's going to make a mess of things. And he did exactly that. <clears throat> and, you know, when you do that, the relationship don't really come back from that. You know what I mean? When you, when you are in a marriage or you're in a relationship and you step outside of that, the trust will never be the same. The relationship will never be the same. You understand what I'm saying? So through the midst of all that, then on top of that, you know, I'm dealing with addiction. We party and drinking together. That's that's all we did. That's all we knew. Nothing was healthy about it. It was it was only toxic. So that was like another chain that the devil kept on me. But um. <clears throat> I ended up going to rehab and um, I got out. We tried to rekindle things that didn't really work out. I ended up relapsing and, you know, I was still in the streets. I ended up selling drugs. You know, I, not only was I doing drugs, but I started selling cocaine and I was making a lot of money off of it. So what happened was that was like another way for the devil to keep that chain on me because I was doing I was I was, you know, I was selling the drugs and I was making money off of it and I was basically getting to do it for free. Okay, so it was that much harder to get clean. 
And um, so, you know, like me and my ex-wife going through what we went through, you know, she got to the point where she ended up, it just got to a point where I was being disrespected. I wasn't, we, neither of us were getting what each other wanted. I wasn't getting what I wanted. She wasn't getting what she wanted. So she was going out at night doing what she wanted to do, not coming back home. I would be at, at home with our son. And that drove me dealing with that and trying to rekindle our relationship and trying to love somebody who didn't want to love you back and didn't want to be with you. It kind of like that kept another chain on me. So it drove me deeper into my addiction. I remember nights that I would do so many drugs and I would end up, I would pop it. I would pop so many ecstasy pills that I literally like, I felt like my heart was going to stop and she didn't care. Right. She was out doing what she wanted to do. And I would be at home with nobody just drowning, just in depression, in this hole of helplessness, in this hole of addiction. And I remember, like I said, so many nights I would, I would pop so many pills just to numb the pain because I was trying to escape from what I was going through and I was trying to escape from the pain that I was dealing with. And the drugs ended up, little do you know, the drugs ended up making it worse, obviously. But um, I remember nights how I popped so many pills that I felt like my heart was gonna stop. So like, little did I know, I was just sitting there night after night waiting to die. I didn't know what was gonna happen with me. You know, I couldn't function, let alone get up and work a job or do anything that I was supposed to be doing. So I was just drowned in my addiction, drowned in this depression. And I remember calling her one night because I thought I was gonna, it was nights I thought I was gonna overdose. Like I said, I thought my heart was gonna stop and she wouldn't answer the phone. Nobody answered the phone for me. So I was just this dude who was consumed by the chains of addiction. And um, <clears throat> for all anybody knew, for all I knew, I could have ended up dying having a heart attack i couldn't end up overdosing and somebody would have came and found me there dead but by the grace and the mercy of my lord and savior jesus christ he was watching over me and literally i know he was protecting me the whole time you know and um so she ended up moving and getting her own place <clears throat> i ended up staying in that place but nothing ever really changed you know i was still doing drugs i was still drinking i was still partying i would go with my homies we were you know we would go out to strip clubs we would go out to bars every night. We would get into fights with people. And, you know, I was just so angry. Like, it was just one of those situations where, like, anywhere I went, it's like I was just waiting on somebody to test me because I was just all the anger and all the pain built up inside me from everything I had been through and all the heartbreak I was dealing with and all the, all the demons I was dealing with. I didn't care unless it was like you looked at me wrong or looked at me a certain way and I just wanted to punch off you. You said something to my homie or he got into it with somebody. We were fighting, we were swinging and the whole time I didn't, you know, I was putting myself in a situation because there was so much death and so much violence going on in Rockford, so many murders, so many shootings. You know, I could have potentially got killed. You know, we, we've been in brawls, we've been in situations where people start shooting. Um, and it's almost like I didn't care. Right, I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew the kind of lifestyle I was involved in. I knew it could end up with death or me going to prison. And it's almost like I didn't even care. Like all the pain, I was just so numb to the pain. And I was just, you know, and when you feed into those demons, right? When you feed into those, the spirit of addiction, the spirit of depression, the spirit of anger, violence, whatever it may be, whatever you're giving into, you don't understand that you're giving the devil legal rights over your life. So by feeding into this anger and feeding into my addiction, I was trapped. I was in chains. You're literally giving the, the devil and giving these demons authority and legal rights over your life. So that means the devil can do with you as he pleases. But whole time, God had so much grace and so much mercy on my life that literally even when I was making bad decisions and even when I was involved in that life, he was still protecting me because little did I know <clears throat> he was going to come save me and he was going to end up using me for his purpose. So... As I'm living like this, you know, I'm selling drugs, doing drugs, getting high every day, going out and partying. Um, things just got worse and worse. Like there's me, me and my ex-wife, which is also the, the, the mother of my son. We There was still like a love there, but there was no respect. There was no maturity. So it's like we, throughout all this time, all these things are happening. We're, we're trying to get back together break up like we would we would break up for a couple months we'd end up trying to get back together it never worked out right it never worked out so <clears throat> but i actually ended up moving into her new place at a point and i remember you know 
like there was still like there was a love there but there wasn't no respect right there wasn't no loyalty there so it's like i was trying to force a relationship on somebody who didn't want to be with me no more right see that's another way that you're giving the devil legal rights over your life because even though you love somebody you got to realize <clears throat> if they don't ever want to change if the demons the spirits that are working behind them the manipulation right the spirit of jezebel the spirit of leviathan the spirit of whatever when that person doesn't want to fight those demons you got to understand that person doesn't want to change you can't force them to change so it's like if you see that in the person and you see they're not going to love you they're not going to respect you they're not going to treat you right but you're still trying to force this person to be with you you got to understand it's like that's another way that you're giving the devil authority over your life because now you're putting yourself through this pain and the devil is sitting there laughing at you like ha ah, jokes on him right he thinks this is going to work out i remember times like i would give her money to pay the bills she had kicked me out the next day i remember one time she kicked me out and i was literally it was it was the middle of winter it was the cold of winter and i had to sleep in my car and not only did i have to sleep in my car but my car broke down so therefore i couldn't turn the heat on so i was literally sleeping in the freezing cold she was laughing she was clowning on me she was disrespecting me she didn't care but this is this also goes to show you right you gotta i never kick somebody with her down you never knock somebody while they're down, right? You never clown somebody while they're down, while they broke, while they're doing bad, while they're homeless, while they ain't got nothing because they'll be the same people to come up and shine, right? They'll be the same people that God uses. So I always learn never kick somebody while you're down. But um, So I ended up going from sleeping in my car that night to having no choice but to live in a crack motel. <clears throat> I was literally, I got to a point, I reached my lowest point. I was living in a crack motel, selling dope. And there was literally like there would be crackheads. I would come out of my apartment or come out of the motel and there was you could see the people. They were all prostituting, selling themselves. They was all doing drugs, smoking crack, doing heroin. I remember nights there would be three, four in the morning and above me I would hear these drug addicts. I would hear these people screaming, but it wasn't like a normal scream. It was like a demonic scream. You know, if you've ever even when I was in California in the streets and I and I ran into certain people, like if you've ever felt the, felt the presence of the devil. Like, I mean, not just ran into a bad person, but really felt the presence of the devil. Like, felt this demonic presence coming off of people and they, like, gave you chills, but not in a good way. Right? It was, like, creepy. And these people would be screaming at the top of their lungs. And it was like they were demon-possessed. And I remember the hotel managers, like, literally coming to their rooms, like, hey, if y'all don't stop, we're going to have to call the police. <clears throat> and it's just, like, I felt this demonic presence and I'm sitting here like, God. Like, this is my life. Like, this is how I'm living, right? And so I was living like that for a while, literally paying like 200 some dollars a week just to live in a crack motel. <clears throat> Selling dope, I ain't have nothing. I remember having a couple garbage bags full of my clothes. And that's all I had. And um, and I remember me and my homie, we went out to the bar one night. And we, we got into an altercation with somebody. But nothing happened there. And like, it wasn't a physical altercation, but it was leading to that. But you know, the bouncers, they came, they told us to leave. Little did I know that night, I was so drunk out of my mind. I was lacking, I didn't know what was going on. You know, we ended up going to the same kickback. Little did I know the dude that I got into it with at the bar was gonna be at the same kickback that I was going to. <clears throat> and let me just tell you, God had mercy on my life. As soon as we pulled, I was in the passenger side because I was too drunk to drive. My homie was driving. As soon as we pulled in the parking lot to this kickback, shots start going off shots start being fired and at first for the first like two seconds i was so drunk and i was so unaware i didn't even know that <clears throat> we were being shot at at first you know but bullets started flying past my face all my windows started being shattered literally and he was shooting the dude was shooting on the same side that i was sitting on i was sitting in the passenger side and that's the side that he was sitting on so if somebody was going to get shot somebody was going to get hit first it was going to be me so literally, I felt bullets flying past my face, all my windows shattering, bullets hitting my car. And my homie grabbed, he stopped the car and he grabbed me out of the car. And literally, when I tell you, I did not get hit by one bullet, probably at least 15 to 20 shots. And it was two different shooters. And I didn't get hit by not one bullet. You know, the crazy part about this is this same dude later on, a long, you know, a while later, he would eventually get charged with a, a quadruple homicide. So this dude was out here killing people. He was out here shooting people. And, you know, I could have been just to think by the grace of God, I didn't get hit by not one bullet. 
and to think that I could have been one of those bodies that dude had. And I didn't know if he really committed all these murders or not. He probably did. I wouldn't put it past him. But um, literally, the dude, a while later, he got charged with a quadruple homicide. And to think that I could have been one of those bodies. But God had enough grace on my life. Even when the devil had authority over my life, God could have very well been like, let the devil do with him as he please. Look at how he living. He ain't living how I want him to live. And um, when I say God literally had his angels encamped around me that night, 15 to 20 shots, bullets flying past my face, car shot up and I didn't get hit not one time. God literally had his angels encamped around me and I am forever grateful to this day. And it's something that I will obviously never forget. But um, as I'm going through this car shot up, I had to spend the last money I had getting my car fixed. That's another way of God saying, hey, that's on you. You know what I'm saying? This money that you already had got from selling dope, I don't want you to have that money anyway. Spend that on getting your car fixed. Had to spend it on getting my car fixed. And um, I just reached the lowest point I had ever hit in life. And you know, it's funny, like a lot of times, God has to let you self-destruct. <clears throat> God has to let you reach your lowest point in life till you realize that you need him, till you realize you can't do it without him. He has to let you fall so low till you have no choice but to reach up back, back up to him with both hands like, God, please pull me back up. Please, I need you, right? And it's not, he doesn't let you fall and self-destruct, right? He doesn't let you fall because he doesn't love you. He does it because he does love you. Because if he, God, see, God is not going to enable you. You can't manipulate God into blessing your sin. So God has to let you fall so low because he does love you. Because he has, that's, that's the only way he's going to help you to realize that you can't do it without him. So I'm sitting here, I get to a point, I'm in the hotel room. And I'm also like going back and forth from the hotel room to my homie's house because he's letting me stay there. <clears throat> and like I just break down and I'm just like, God, what do you want from me? Like I know this ain't all you got for me. Like look at how I'm living. This can't be it. I know I know this this isn't the life I'm supposed to be living. This isn't all that you have for me. I know you have something for you have something more for me. And I said, God, I'm tired of doing things my way. Because I literally, I remember how many times as I was living like this. It's funny because I have to confess, like, I always knew that I was, you know, I was, there was something special. There was something in me. Like, everybody knew I was different. People could see that there was, like, a type of greatness in me, a, a type of uh, a type of anointing in me that God put in me. But I always ignored it, right? And I had knew for a long time that God was calling on me. But I literally, you know, would tell God I didn't want nothing to do with him. Literally, I remember times I would say out loud, like, God, leave me alone. Like, let me do things my way. Go call on somebody else. This is my life. I want to do it my way. Well, apparently you see where that got me. <laughs> and um, even through all that, even, even through all that, me literally telling God I didn't want nothing to do with him. Go call on somebody else. I don't want nothing to do with you. Just leave me alone. Even after all that, he still loved me enough to come find me and bring me back home. He still loved me enough to come find me and bring me back home, even when I didn't want nothing to do with him. That's how much God loves us. That's how much he loves you. For anybody watching this right now, you need to know that. <laughs> but um, like I said, back to the hotel room thing, <clears throat> I got to a point, I just broke down and I said, God, I know this isn't all you got for me. You got something more for me. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm done doing things my way. I'll do things your way. Just show me what you want me to do. I'll do it. So, um, I actually ended up moving into my homie's house. He let me stay there for a little while, and I, I just knew that it was about that time. I didn't know how I was going to do it, how I was going to survive, but I knew God was telling me to stop selling dope. So I did. All right, so I stopped selling dope. I didn't know how I was going to survive because that's the only way I was making money for so long. But um, it's funny because the very next night after I stopped selling dope, every clientele I had, they started hitting my phone and banging my phone twice as much as they did before. But the devil is a liar. That could have been the very time that I ended up getting caught. And I was like, should I do it, bro? Look at all this money I'm missing out on. My homie was like, no, nah, don't do it. That's the devil. I'm like, I know I already know it's the devil. So I didn't do it. I didn't go sell no more. I didn't um, feed into it. I ignored it. It was hard, but I ignored it. Because in, in my head, my first thought is, look at all this money that's calling me. But... <clears throat> then I had to realize, like, this is the devil right now. This is the devil. And this is a test from God. So <clears throat> literally a week later, a family member gave me $1,000. 
So this was just a test from God to see if I was going to feed into that and go back to that. I said no to that money. I said no to the devil. A week later, a family member blessed me with $1,000. And then a couple weeks after that, I got a job working full time. And God had blessed me and he was trying to provide for me because I was doing the right things and I was choosing him. And um, I stopped doing drugs. I stopped doing all that. And, you know, like, it's funny that, like, rehab, I, I never got clean from doing rehab. I never, I, I've been to rehab twice. I relapsed both times. I didn't get clean until I met a man named Jesus Christ. Let me understand. Let me tell you something so y'all understand. There is no rehab. There is no institution. There is no rehabilitation on earth that can do the things that Jesus Christ can do. I mean, there's no rehab that, that, that can do what Jesus can do. There was no rehab that could have got me clean. There was no 12-step program that could have got me clean. Jesus Christ was the one who got me clean. And um, so understand when I got this job too, right? See, this wasn't my destiny. This was just the beginning. So God was basically telling me, all right, you know, this ain't what you want right now, but you got to understand everything is a process. So this job was just to sustain me. So God was like, all right, you got to settle for less right now. So that I can prepare you for better later. All right. This is the way of you that you're going to pay your dues and that you're going to show me you can be consistent paying your dues, settling for less while I prepare you for better. And something told me to go to church. <clears throat> right. Something told me to go to church. So I ended up looking up on Facebook, the old church I used to go to when I was a kid that my mom brought me to. And um, so I went to this church and I met um, I met a brother named Chad Burgess. OK, so. Is, uh, he took me out to eat one day and um, I was sharing with him my testimony. And as I was sharing my testimony, he kind of paused for a second. And he was like, you know, he was like, you sound like a preacher. And I was like, a preacher? <clears throat> and, you know, it's crazy. Everything kind of hit me at once. God spoke to me and kind of reminded me all of these years, even, even when I was living wrong, even when I was, you know, I was in the streets, when I was, you know, gang banging, selling dope doing drugs, even even when I was living like this, all these years, I didn't realize, you know, I had always been the homie that kind of like preached to people. I was always the homie that was always speaking real stuff to people. I was always the homie that was giving people advice. I was always the homie that, that, that people came to for advice. So like low key, all these years, I had low key, I had been preaching to people, but it never dawned on me that I would ever be preaching the gospel. You know, and, and it's crazy because... <clears throat> I have to go back to when I was three, four years old, because this this whole situation, he was like, you know, you sound like a preacher. And um, <clears throat> I remember that my mom had told me a story, right? I was prophesied to when I was three, four years old, but it's something that I just kind of like, I knew God would do great things with me, but I was always like a rapper, right? I always, uh, I'm dope with the music. You know, I was always a rapper. I always loved music. So that's what I thought I was going to do. But when I was three, four years old, I was prophesied to. So this, this this guy that my mom knew, he came, I guess he came to do some work or to clean the house or something like that. And he saw me sleeping and he asked my mom, hey, can I pray for your son? So this guy, he started praying over me. And all of a sudden, my mom said, all of a sudden he started speaking in tongues. And she was like, I was kind of freaked out because I didn't, this is, was far before my mom ever got saved. So like she knew of God, but like she didn't really know God. She didn't know Jesus. She didn't know much about that. This was before she got saved. So she was like what's this guy doing? He's standing over my son, speaking in tongues and stuff like that. And when he got done, he looked at my mom and he said, I don't think you realize how special your son is. Like God just gave me a vision that he would be preaching the gospel and that he was going to be speaking to large crowds of people and he was going to impact a lot of people one day. Whew. So this like this, this vision or this, you know, I got prophesied to when I was three, four years old, my mom had kind of, you know, she had mentioned it to me over the years. But throughout all the years, all the all the stuff I was going through, she was like, okay, guys, so what was that? This dude prophesied to my son. But the whole time I didn't know and she didn't know that everything I had went through in life, all the bad, deci bad decisions, all the trials and tribulations, all the pain and suffering, all of that was preparing me for the purpose that God had for me. All of that was leading up to it. See, God has to break you so that he can build you up. He has to let you be broken and let you make those bad decisions and let you go through all that pain and suffering to realize that you need him. And now he can build you up into his image. All right. So after that uh, breakfast I had with my brother, Chad Burgess, and he said, you sound like a preacher. All of that came to me at once. And I was like, it just came to me and I ran with it. God spoke to me. He's like, son, you're going to preach the gospel. 
And um, it was crazy because I never, if you would have ever told me I was going to be preaching the gospel, I was like, yeah, right, that's, you tripping. No. And um, because I had always wanted to rap and I was good at it too. But you got to understand you can't serve two guys at one time. So you can't glorify the streets and be serving the devil doing that, talking about the streets and serve God at the same time. So I had got saved. I had gone to this church. That was the first step. God spoke to me, told me to go to the church. I had met my brother Chad Burgess. He had spoken that I was going to be a preacher. And um, what I started doing, he also showed me how to do what's called devos. So it's like reading the Bible and then you take the message, whatever God spoke to you through that verse, and you write it down. So I literally, that's what I was doing. This is how pastors, you know, basically how they preach. They read the Bible and they write a diva or they take whatever message God spoke to them through that verse Either how they compare it to their life or how they compare it to their own experiences or whatever message God spoke to them. And that's what they preach. So I had become obsessed. I was so hungry for the word, right? God had put this, this, this fire in my heart for him. My heart was on fire for the Lord. And that's all I wanted to do. All I did was read the Bible, take notes, take notes on my life experiences, write down the messages that God was speaking to me. I would watch other, uh, uh, other pastors and preachers and teachers. I would, I would constantly out every day, I would watch a sermon and I was taking notes, you know, on other pastors, on other people I was learning from. And that's what I did. So, man, this is a big part of the testimony, though, that I got to share with you. Right. And, and for anybody watching this right now, I want you to understand something huge. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you got to understand that doesn't mean the pain stops. That doesn't mean the, the attacks from the devil stops. You got to understand when you when you first get saved. That's when the devil is going to attack you the most. All right. So right after I got saved, I had got a letter that I had a warrant out for my arrest. Yeah. See, what the devil does is when you first get saved, then he sends an attack your way. And he's going to try to accuse God to you. So basically, like, oh, if God really loved you, he's going to start putting thoughts in your head. Like, if God really loved you, would he let you go through this? He doesn't really love you. You just got saved. You just laid your life down for him. And look what you're going through. He don't really love you. So right after I got saved, a few weeks later, <clears throat> I found out I had a warrant for my arrest. I turned myself in and bonded out. And I was facing prison time. I was facing five years in prison. But you know, I knew what this was. I knew the devil was trying to attack me. I said, God, I'm not going to turn my back on you. I never stopped going to church. I never stopped reading my Bible. I never stopped praying to God. I never stopped serving him. So I just dealt with it and I just rolled with it. And mind you, this charge, it was a forgery charge. So like a scam situation with a debit card. Mind you, this is a crime that I had committed a year and a half prior <clears throat> to, um, to getting saved. So something that I had did a year and a half prior came back to bite me right after I had just given my life to Jesus Christ. So long story short, month after month, court date after court date, my, my attorney is like, yo, <clears throat> you know, if you if you if your record was clean before this, you know, if this was your first charge, we might be able to get you off. We might be able to get you off on probation. But because of your priors, you got to understand they're not budging on the prison time. My attorney kept telling me month after month, he's like, I'm trying my best. I don't know what you want me to do. You're leaving me in a spot. I'm trying my best. The judge isn't budging on prison time. The state's attorney, he's not budging on prison time. So fast forward one month, the court date before my sentencing court date, he said, look, I don't know what I can do. He's like, I'm trying my best. I'm going to do what I can do. But the state's attorney, they're still not budging on the five years prison time. And this could have turned me away from God. This was all a test. Right. But I told God, I said, you know what, <clears throat> as angry as I was and as, as hurt as I was and as scared as I was, I said, God, you know what? I still love you. And I know that if it's in your will, I said, if it's in you, I prayed to God. I said, if it's in your will for me to do this prison time, I trust you. And I know that it's for a reason and I, it will only make me stronger and you will only bring me out stronger. I said, if it's in your will for me to do this prison time, I know it's for a reason and it's only going to be for my good. I said, I will not turn away from you. I will continue to follow you. So fast forward, my last, my sentencing court date came up and um, my attorney comes up to me. I'm sitting here. I don't know if this is going to be the last day I see daylight. I don't know if that was going to be the last time I saw my kids for a few years. I don't know if I'm going to prison. And I come to my last, my sentencing court date. My attorney comes up to me and he says, well, Mr. Larson, <clears throat> I don't know what to tell you, but um, I just got you off with two years probation and no prison time. 
I was like, if my God is not a faithful God, for seven, eight months straight stressing, still following God, still walking in my purpose, not knowing if I was going to go to prison. Attorney constantly telling me that they're not budging on the prison time. And God still, through, all, through that test, through my perseverance, and because of his grace, because of his grace, he got me off with two years probation and no prison time. And I was for sure I was going to prison. When I tell you my God is a good God and he will not forsake you, even through all the bad decisions I made, even through all the, the screw-ups, all the, all the pain and suffering, all the mistakes I made, he still had grace enough on my life. He still had mercy on my life to let me get off with, with, uh, with probation because he knew what he was going to use me for. He knew that um, that wasn't part of the plan, right? I had grown so much and God was using me that the transformation that people saw in me, it, it was something that, that they had never seen before, you know, like... I was already impacting people. God was already using me to impact people at the church. I was preaching. You know what I started doing? I didn't yet have the pat the platform to preach on stage or preach at a church service. So what I did <clears throat> is I started recording videos of myself preaching, uh, preaching knowledge, inspirational things, and I started posting them on social media. And um, you know, as I was doing this, I didn't know the kind of reactions I would get. You know, but I started posting myself preaching on Facebook. TikTok, Instagram, and people started reacting. I started getting feedback from people. That was like another confirmation from God, like this is what you're supposed to be doing. You know, I see in the way that it affected people, like, wow, bro, like your videos, they're so inspirational, like they're so motivational. Like, thank you for the for the knowledge, for the wisdom. And I was like, wow, like so it wasn't necessarily about the feedback, but it was because that was like another confirmation, like, okay, like these are these videos. The words that God is speaking through me, like they're affecting people, they're impacting people. So that was like another confirmation that God was saying, yes, like keep doing this. So I'm um, yeah, through all that. And you know, it's crazy, like right after I got saved, right after I got baptized too, was the hardest three weeks of my life. I wouldn't say of my life, but it was a really, it was a really rough three weeks. And I'm telling you, I can't stress it enough. You only got to understand your God will not forsake you. Everything that the devil used against you, the God is actually playing him for your benefit. And the devil don't even know a whole time he think he got a hold of you. Understand, when you get saved, the devil is going to attack you. You got to trust and put your faith in God that he will deliver you. After I got saved and came up out that water, was one of the, it, was, it was three of the hardest weeks I had had in a long time. <clears throat> right, and um, baby mama issues, court issues, finances, like it was just so stressful. But I got through it and God pulled me through. So after I, um, what happened next, what's going on? <laughs> um, I get put on probation. I share that with people. That also motivated people. That confirmed to me, okay, <clears throat> God is using me. I know what God has for me. This was just more confirmation of how good my God was and to build up that strength and endurance in my faith in him and to always trust him. But you know what's crazy? This wouldn't be the last time I would fall, though. Um... A while after that, you know, I started to get impatient, right? I had started to, um, you know, it was one of those things where God was preparing me. And um, you got to be patient through that process, right? Because what, what had happened was, is I felt like God's will for my life wasn't coming fast enough. So I started to get impatient. I started to be hasty. And I started to be like, y'all, man, I'm tired of this guy. What are you doing? Like, I should be making more money. I should be getting more opportunities. So I started to go back off of my own will <clears throat> and started to feed into the devil. And um, I started rapping again. Now, there's nothing wrong with music, right? There's nothing wrong with, like, but the way I was rapping, I was rapping about the streets. And even though it wasn't my intention to get back in the streets, it's crazy because when I started rapping about the streets and started glorifying the streets again, it was it was definitely a downfall because it wasn't my intention to get back in the streets. But I noticed when I started rapping about this kind of stuff, it was drawing those evil spirits back to me. It was drawing that demonic energy right back into my life because I was speaking it. So it's like I was summoning it. Right. So I started being around negative people again. I started being in the streets again. I started that same foot I pulled out. I put that foot right back in the streets. And, you know, there's this this saying in Matthew or the scripture, I'm sorry, the scripture in, in, in Matthew. And it says, when a man is delivered, that demon, it goes through arid places, through dry places. Eventually it returns back to the house 
where it once possessed and it finds it unoccupied and swept clean and it goes and grabs seven spirits more wicked than itself and goes in and dwells there and in that house that person is in worse condition than it was before so you got to understand when you open that door back up for them demons not only does that one demon come back in, but it goes and grabs seven of his homies more wicked than itself. And it comes in and possesses you and you're worse off than you were before. So it just started off with me wanting to do pursue my original dream of doing music. But it opened it, that door for all them demons to basically attract back to me and come back into my life. And I noticed I was around the wrong people again. I was around people gangbanging. I was around people doing drugs. I was around people and I'm sitting there. And like people, you know, they constantly talking about who they into it with, what op they wanted to get, who is that, who who's beefing it with who, who's doing what, who's into it with who. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, God spoke to me and he's like, son, <clears throat> he's like, what are you doing? He's like, this, this ain't you no more. Remember what I, I called you out of this for a reason, to do my prayer. You're supposed to be out here ministering to people, leading people. And here, here you are with these people. Basically serving the devil's purpose. I had dropped the music video basically glorifying the streets. And um, people were calling me from the church like, yo, your brother Jordan, you all right? What's, what's going on? Like, what, you know, they were holding me accountable as a brother as they should. And obviously at the time, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear what they had to say. But God knew that in time, I would eventually recommit myself and repent and come to my senses. <clears throat> so as I'm around these people and I'm living like this, um... God spoke to me and he said, son, what are you doing? He said, remember, that this ain't you no more. What are you doing here with these people? This ain't you no more. You don't live like this no more. And he said to me, he said, son, you know you got a choice to make, right? He said, it's either me or the world. And you can't choose both. And you know that. From that day forward, I came to my senses, came back from my drunken stupor, and I recommitted myself. I repented. I oh, deleted the music video and that was done. And I recommitted myself. I, I, I left my old life alone. Um, I laid my life down every old selfish way, pattern, behavior, desire, habit, every every old worldly desire. I laid it down and picked my cross back up to follow Jesus Christ and I recommitted myself. But you gotta understand, and you know, luckily that 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 downfall I had it was only for a couple months. That slip up I had it was only for a couple months, but if I had let that go on too long, it would eventually led to my destruction. Right? It would eventually led to me um it could have potentially led to my death or me going to prison. Because how many times did God give me this chance and he knew I knew what he was calling on me for? Right? And, and you know, again, nothing's wrong with music, but I just decided I knew deep down in my heart, I knew in my spirit that God wanted me to focus on preaching. Leave the street music alone, cut that off. So I laid that down and put away my old selfish desires and my old dreams to follow Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, it's the best decision I ever made and I have never looked back since and I, ne and I never will. But it's it's crazy because it's like you know I, when I was living like that and I was when I went through that that downfall, I wasn't praying, I wasn't reading the Bible, and when I went back to trying to pray again, it's like <clears throat> those demons had sucked the anointing out of me. Right, everything that God spoke to me when I would sit down to pray, it's like I didn't know how to pray anymore. I had to learn how to pray all over again. I would sit down to pray, but the words wouldn't come to my mind. It's like them demons was trying to cloud my mind and stop me from being able to pray. When I would read the Bible, God wasn't speaking to me the same way he was before. You know, I was always really good at interpreting the Bible and interpreting the message that God was speaking through me. Or, or I'm, I'm sorry, speaking through the Bible. And I just had one of, you know, a lot of people don't understand the Bible. You got to come to it with the, from, a, from a spiritual approach. And, um... It's a gift that I had to be able to interpret and understand the Bible. And I would read the Bible and it's like I had to learn how to read the Bible all over again. God wasn't speaking to me the same. I would read a verse and my mind would go somewhere else. Or I'd read a verse and I didn't understand what I was reading because those demons had taken back over me. Understand, you will be in worse condition than you were before if you let those spirits back in. So long story short, I got my anointing back. I am more anointed than ever. God is speaking to me more than ever. The Holy Spirit within me is working and he's moving more than ever. And I am so forever grateful for that. And, um, but it took me weeks of, of consistent prayer, having to force myself to pray, right? Having to force myself to read the Bible to really get that anointing back. And over time, eventually, after like a month or two, God started speaking to me again. But it took me walking in obedience. I had to cut everybody off, understand God is going to delay your blessings 
and he's going to hold off your blessings on what he has for you if you're not letting those old people or that old lifestyle go. If you're still holding on to certain things or certain people that are interfering with the blessings God has for you, he's going to hold that off. Because all those people are going to do if God gives you those blessings and those opportunities too soon, you're going to screw it up. You got to let certain people go. You got to isolate yourself. It's going to be lonely. Walking in obedience isn't always fun, but you got to remember the bigger picture. Amen. Everybody wasn't meant to go where you're going. The people that's holding you back, once God transforms you and he and he pours into you, he wants to pour into you and he puts an anointing on your life, you got to consecrate yourself. You got to separate yourself. Right? You are automatically going to be set apart. You can't go here. You can't drink that. You can't hang out with these people. You can't go hang. You can't go to this place. It don't work like that because it's only going to interfere with what God is doing in your life. So I had to do that. I had to separate myself, dedicate myself, and um, over time I got my anointing back. And let me just tell you, I am more grateful than ever. You know, God is speaking to me more than he ever has, like the knowledge and the wisdom that he's been giving me lately. It's almost overwhelming because it really, it sets you apart so much because you can't really relate to other people. Because most people you will find, like, once you reach a certain level of knowledge and wisdom, and don't let that make you self-righteous, right? Always remain humble. But once you reach a certain level of knowledge, you got to understand most people don't have the knowledge that God has given you. So... They're not going to understand. So it's almost like frustrating at the same time. And it's overwhelming because God is giving you so many spiritual downloads and he's speaking to you so much. It's like, man, I got to write all this down so that I could use it to teach other people. But um, <clears throat> listen, everything that I've been through in life, everything that the devil sent to destroy me, God actually played him and used it for my benefit. Everything that the devil sent to destroy me. God flipped the script on him and used it to build me up into his image and used it for his glory and used it to turn me into a warrior. Understand, God's, um, God gives his hardest battles to his strongest soldiers. Amen. So anybody who's watching this right now, who's going through things, who's questioning their faith, questioning that God loves them, you got to understand everything, everything that I went through, every demon I faced. I wouldn't have had the power to take authority back over those demons and, and beat those demons if I didn't have Jesus Christ. Jesus is the reason that I am where I am today. And Jesus is the one who set me free. There is nothing in life, nobody, anyone, anything that could have saved me from everything I went through and everything that I did, every bad decision that I made, every trial and tribulation I went through, building me back up from every pain and suffering that I felt. It's all because of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because I decided to lay my life down, pick up my cross and follow him. But it's not because, let me rephrase that, it's not because of me, it's because of his grace. It's because of his grace and his mercy that we even get the opportunity and the second chance to get it right. It's because he died for our sins and washed us clean that we even get the opportunity and that we even get the chances that we get to live out the purpose that he has for our life. Amen. Now... It's it's just crazy because <clears throat> all that that I went through, you know, being prophesied two or three, four years old, going through everything I went through, and still, even after I got saved, I ended up slipping back, and God still had mercy, still had grace on my life. Our God is a good God. He is a faithful God, and I want you to know anybody who's watching this right now who's going through anything, you got to realize you are looking for that life everywhere else except where you're supposed to look for that life, right? God will give you a kind of life. God will give you the kind of life that you always wanted, but you're looking for it in other places and you're wondering why you're not getting it. And the way God wants to do things in your life, it might not be how you wanted originally, but you will realize that it's the life that you always wanted, just his way, just doing it in his, um, just doing it his way and not your way. Because when you do things your way, you got to understand you're actually leading yourself astray and you don't even know it. You're feeding into your demons. You're giving the devil legal rights over you and the devil can do with, as, do with you as he pleases. When you have no Jesus in your life, what do you think is going to be filling that void? So you're following your old selfish ways. You're following it and, and, and trying to chase after your worldly desires. But there's always an emptiness in you. You might have money. You might become successful, whatever you think you're going to do. But many of us are drowning and self-destructing because we're trying to follow our own will for our life instead of following God's will for our lives. And the whole time, we don't even realize God's will. There is no better life that we could give ourselves than God could give us. So I just want you to know anybody who's watching this right now that needed to hear this. 
God is waiting on you and he's calling you home. Everything you're going through, all the pain and suffering, the only person that can set you free and rebuild you into that person that he created you to be is him. The only person that can save you from your demons is him. The only person that can set you free from addiction, all that pain and suffering is him. So I just want you to know, anybody who's watching this right now, this was for you and it's about that time. Lay down your life to pick up your cross and I promise you, you will not regret it. Amen. Jesus is the way, the light, and the truth. Jesus is king. Amen. Come on, let's get it.